that's uh, that's my email there. Um, I got a school email too, but I got them both on my phone. That's my cell phone number. And then if you want to hit me on Twitter, it's at Coach Wooster. Um, I'm going to be uh, real quick on a, on a, a just an idea in terms of fundamentals up front. And it's not just offensive line. It's any guy that blocks. Um, I want to define leverage and then talk about it in applied sense because I think this is a misunderstood idea in the game of football. Um, and I've been through this kind of uh, reinvention of myself or rebirth as a line coach the last few years. And it's been exciting as heck to, to kind of go through this. And I, I want to share some of that with you guys. So if you have any more questions about what we do and how we do it, uh, please uh, shoot a text, shoot a DM, shoot an email, and, and I can get some more of this, this idea to you. All right. So I'm going to get this thing going. Um, like I said, that's my contact and we will roll. All right. First of all, let's get it defined. All right. It says O-line fundamentals, but like I said, anyone that blocks. So the first thing, and, and because we're limited on time, I usually like to start this off by asking, what is your definition of leverage? And what I hear a lot of times, and what I said for 15 years, and when I said five years as a player and then 15 years coaching the, the position, I said, was well, pad under pad, it's hat under hat, it's hip under hip. And I had all these different words to, to describe it. But I really got thinking about last few years, last five years really, I've been on this journey. Uh, some guys like Charles Bentley and, and some other people have kind of opened my eyes to this and we've really been digging into it. I think you have to define leverage. And for us, for me, leverage is simply this. It's a position of power, all right? So out leverage the defense with tight end wing. Um, defender, you're gonna leverage the football. It's a position of power on the football field. As a blocker, you have to add balance. So for us, it's very simply, it's a balanced position of power. It's a balanced position of power in all three planes of movement. And I'm not going to get too sciencey. You know, I, I love kinesiology. I love physics, but I'm not going to get into it too much, but it's all three planes. So you can't just be balanced vertically. All right. Or you just can't have leverage vertically. You need it laterally and you need it rotationally. So in the sagittal plane, the frontal plane and the transverse, the rotational plane, you need to be balanced and you've got to be in that position of power. So many times when you talk about leverage and if you said it's pad level, it's hat under hat, hip under hip, you're just talking about the vertical plane, all right? Football is not played that anymore, especially with, I mean, the techniques they're talking about, this sling, push, pull, all these different great block defeat techniques they got, we've got to be balanced in all three planes, all right? The other thing I believe, and I talk to the guys about all the time, is what is the goal of a successful block? What's the goal of a dominant block? And basically, we're going to say this, all right? Our goal is to break the defender's leverage. Because when we break his position of power in one, two, or all three of those planes, so I could break him rotationally, I could break him vertically, or I could break him laterally, all right? And usually that's with a, a fit or an aim point, or a, we talk about a knee target, all right? I've got control of him. I've got control of that block. I can create space for the football, all right? So we're going to dominate by destroying their leverage. Okay, by maintaining our leverage, our position of power, again, all three plays, it allows us to block with optimal or in really maximal force in all four phases of the block. And I'm not going to, that's a, a different talk for a different time, but the approach, transition, sustain, and finish, all right, so that's that stance and start, two contact, the strike and the surge of the hips, and then sustaining co uh, contact. And it might not be always maintaining your leverage, it might be I get out of leverage, and then I got to reattain. I got to get back to that position of power. All right. So that's our definition. And that's our goal of a successful block. So I'm going to get right into the applied part of this. All right. So this balanced position of power that we talk about. Okay. We don't talk about pad level. And I'm going to get into that in just a second. All right. We talk about 345s. And if you spend any time with Charles Bentley and OLP, I urge you to do that. It was, you know, it's just a, a great way to start thinking about things a little different way. All right. So 45 in the ankle, knee, and hip, like I said. It's one of my guys from the other place, fantastic football player, probably going to have a shot in the, in the league here, but a 45-degree angle in the ankle to create that positive shin angle, all right, for equal and opposite foot and force in the ground. 45 in the knee, all right, going to create a co-contraction or really a tri-contraction between the quadricep, the hamstring, and the glutes, all right? Some people say, hey, I, I got to get that knee bent, get down lower, get the hips down lower. Okay, that's great, but now it's just a co-contraction. It's just quadricep and hamstring but at 45 I can use the biggest three muscle groups in my body the quads the hams and the glute group 
all right? And then a 45 degree right here in the hip. And what that does is keep the center of gravity centered and it keeps the center of gravity in an optimal position. You know, it used to be flat back, get a flat back. Too many times that overextends, forward extends the center of gravity. If I get push pulled, uh, if I don't uh, connect with my strike, I'm gonna be on my face, that guy quick swim me, push pull me, whatever, okay? So again, the 45 in the ankle, creates that shin angle. So I can put force in the ground, all right? On this angle back, create a vector here to put my body forward, okay? Newton's second law, Newton's third law. Force equals mass times acceleration, and then the equal and opposite part of that, okay? Why 45? I talked a little bit about with the tri, con uh, the tri contraction and getting the synergy from all those lower body muscles, right? The other part of it, it's the optimal angle to get the power and the pace or the rhythm of the feet, okay? So I can be as fast as I need to be. And a lot of times offense line isn't about playing fast. It's about playing with control and pace and rhythm, all right? But I can move my feet and that rhythm of the feet, okay, with the optimal and have as much power. If my hips are low, I might create a little bit more power maybe. I still don't think that because of the track contraction, okay? But I can't move my feet as fast. I might be able to move a little faster if my hips are higher, but I don't create as much power, okay? And I don't lower my center of gravity. So it's the optimal, uh, optimal angle to get both those things going. And then some joint centration things too. That would be a different talk down the road, okay? Like I said, foot frequency, you can move with efficiency. And the biggest thing is it allows those glutes to work the hips to surge. Okay, just put this one clip on here because the 45. And, and I, you know, I'm a believer that an image is worth a thousand words, pictures worth a thousand words, a, a video is worth maybe a hundred thousand or a million. All right, so this is that same guy, big old squatter, 545 pounds on his back. We're going to get to 90 degrees. All right, why are we going to get to 90 degrees? To stabilize the knee joint, quadricep hamstring. Okay, but we've all felt this. All right. Any guy that's ever squatted, it's the hole. You get down to 90 degrees, and it's everything you got, man, to get out of the hole, right? And watch his face. And I screwed up on the camera here. I mean, his face, that is absolute strain. But once the knee hits 45 degrees, the hips can, uh, the hips can get involved. The hips can surge. The glutes go, and now I've got all three of my major muscle groups going. And it, it doesn't get easy, but boom, there's that surge. There's that pop, all right? And you can watch the bar. Oh. At the top. Why? Because right at that 45 degrees, all the big three muscle groups are going. And you guys probably see this in the weight room. You'll see it tomorrow morning. What happens? The guys put all the weight on there. He's got the four plates on there. And what's he do? He goes down to 45 and back up. Why? Because he knows he's stronger there. He knows he has more power. Okay? Why do we got to squat all the way down? Okay, get the co-contraction and everything else. But we want to play where we're the strongest. Play them at 45 degrees. Okay. So we were getting creative with some of our our, our, our workouts, right? So one guy pushed a truck and then one guy pushed a van and then there's a guy out of Hudsonville, Michigan, Lane Potter. He says, well, shoot, I'll push my dad's semi-truck, okay? Well, I just wanted to show you this clip because I think it's ultra important here, okay? What's that knee at right when the foot strikes the ground? It's at 45 degrees, all right? And I remember I asked Lane, I said, were you thinking get my knee at 45 because I'll create the optimal power? He said, no, coach, I'm trying to push the damn semi. I said, Exactly right. It's your body telling you that's where I'm the most powerful. Okay, so that knee's at 45. All three major muscle groups are, are moving, and he can push this semi, okay? So the 45 degree, I'm the strongest. I got the most power. I can use all three major muscle groups of the lower body. Okay, here's that same guy. Here's 72. He's just pushing the semi truck, okay? So I want to show you, I want to show you that initial approach right there. And I'm going to back it up and freeze it just for a count. All right, so we want to talk about 345s, all right? Gosh, dang it. Come on, Scott. All right, 345s right there. All right, 345s, 45 in the, the ankle, the knee, and the hip. I got the shin angle so I can put force in the ground this way and move him that way. 45 in the knee so I can create the most power, and then 45 at the hip so I'm balanced, but I can lift. Right at this point, lane 72 is starting to break that defender's leverage vertically. That's all I'm showing you right here, okay? Just the 345s in the lower body base and stagger, okay? Now, that's vertically. He started to, to break the defender's leverage, his position of power, with lift, all right, with the hip surging. Now, that defender ain't just going to stand there like a sled and let you push him back. He's going to use some kind of block defeat. Maybe it's a sling. Maybe it's push-pull. 
rip, swim, whatever those moves are, okay? So we also have to be side to side. We have to be in a position of power laterally. How do we do that? We call it base and stagger. So 345s to get that vertical plane, that vertical position of power, and then base and stagger, okay? So uh, base basically is sturdy, solid. We use the instep or the arch side of the foot. I use the term arch pressure. I want all those cleats in the ground, the whole foot on the ground. It's like roots of a tree. The bigger the tree gets, what happens? The roots go not just straight down, but they go out to stabilize that tree, okay? And then we also have to have a stagger, okay? So I'm back and forth, not just laterally, but forward and backward, I'm sturdy too. And I put a picture of this Harley Davidson, this big old bike right here is held up by this little kickstand. It doesn't have to be much of a stagger. If I'm on the left side, usually my left foot's back just a little bit, all right? If I'm on the right side, that right foot's back. But I always have a stagger, all right, in pass protection or in run blocking. I always got one foot behind the other to create a position of power front to back. Okay, and then the third thing we do, we engage the inner thighs. All right, back in the day, it was a Jim McNally thing we used to say. I know these cameras are tough, but we used to say we pinch the knees, all right? We pivot the knees and create a lower body triangle, okay? And it was good because it created shin angles so I could, again, Newton's third law, if I wanted to go right, I could push, or I could push off my left, all right, in step, all right? I create that shin angle to move laterally. Trouble with that is it puts a lot of stress on the MCL. Okay, so what we've changed the idea to is engage the inner, uh, inner thighs. Squeeze those adductor muscles, and specifically it's the VMO. So we squeeze those inner thigh muscles, all right? And what that does is create a shin angle. So if, if Landon right here, if he wanted to move to his left, he could put force in the ground on this vector, all right? So equal and opposite, he can move left. So now the, the 45 degree angle in the, uh, or in the angle in the ankle, I can go forward. I squeeze my inner thighs, create a lower body triangle. Now I can move left and right. Okay. Now I can move left and right. All right. Let, let's show how we get into that. Okay. So the next picture here is just how we get into our stance. Now we don't get up on the line of scrimmage and do this, but this is the first day of camp. This is the first day of summer, first day of spring, first day of winter conditioning. And shoot, week four, I'm going to jump them back in this and let's get back in our stance. Okay. So what we do is we get their feet right close together. All right. And I tell them to bounce it out. And he bounces that thing out until he feels the weight shift to his arch side of his foot. We call it the instep, all right? The other thing that you see that naturally happens is he toes out a little bit, just like in the squat rack. It's our body saying that's where we're the sturdiest. That's where the, we're the most stable, all right? And then he'll posture back and forth to feel the weight shift to the instep, all right? Then he's going to squeeze his inner thighs, all right? He's going to squeeze his inner thighs, and then he's going to get a big butt and big chest. We'll talk about arch here in a second, all right? He's going to flex his wrist, rotate his elbows back. Now, he takes that palm of the hand, all right? We call it the tip of the spear. That's what we connect with. That's what we strike with. And he slides it right down his thigh boards until it hits the top of the knee. Typically, all right, right there, that position, we've got our 345s, our shin angles, all right? He squeezes inner thighs, so he's got shin angles left to right and forward and back, okay? Got his big butt, big chest, so he's stable through the middle of the body. And then the chin is up. Elbows are rotated back. Wrists are flexed. That's our two-point stance. Right? And then if I say get in a three-point, all he's going to do is visualize his left eyeball falls out of the socket, and it hits right below it, and he's just going to take four fingers and a thumb and gently rest them on the ground. So it's a balanced stance. It's a balanced position to start. It's a balanced position that we're going to block with. Okay, here's a side picture of it. All he's done right here, he's got right in that stance, and we just call it hand carry. All right, so all he's done is brought his hands up, and I say elbows right in front of the hip bones, hands in front of the elbows. All right, and the hands are apart. Why are the hands are apart? Okay, so, and we'll get into, you know, maybe strike down the road one of these days. But we use a, a torque strike where we're going to supinate the elbow inside, create more power, more force in the short area. All right, the other thing is why we want our hands apart is if that defender gets one, okay, I still got one. If I carry my hands together and that defender swipes, he gets one, he gets both, okay? So that's our, that's our run blocking position, 345s. Big butt, big chest, arch in the lower back, arch in the neck, okay? So we got the front picture and the side picture of that. Okay, next thing we're going to look at is now that lane, lane again. Here's that left guard. I showed you where he was just starting to break that three techniques, vertical leverage, okay? But now watch what happens, okay? He's broken the vertical leverage. He's got 45s. He's straight-legged, right? Hands are inside and underneath. Elbows are tight. They're supinated in. He's in, he's in a balanced position of power. He's owning this block. 
but they're not going to stay there for us. Okay. They're coached too. So he uses what we call, some people call it tear. I just call it a sling where he's going to try to sling us off him. Okay. He's trying to break our lateral leverage. Okay. In that frontal plane, he's trying to sling us off. Lane gets out of his balance position power. He loses leverage for a second. Okay. You're not going to be in perfect leverage through that, the entire block, but watch what happens. He gets back to leverage. All right. He gets back to his position of power and he stays connected all the way through that block. And you can see at the end there, he gives a shove off. He out, outplays him. That's our finish right there. Okay. So it's a perfect picture of he breaks the initial leverage. All right. We saw that picture right there. He breaks the initial leverage. The defender fights back, breaks our lateral leverage. We get back to our position of power and drive him five yards down the field and finish the block on our knee target. Okay. But I always get the question now, well, coach, what about pad level? All right. My whole career, my whole life. Everyone's always taught it's got to be chin under uh, helmet under chin. I've got to be lower. Low man wins. That's leverage. Okay, I get it. Talked about 45 creates that balance position of power. Okay, the center of gravity is in a position to move the defender vertically while sustaining the block. Shoot, you might get more initial movement, but once that guy quick swims, once that guy push pulls, you're going to be on your face. We can stay connected with the 45. Okay, we can stay connected. And we believe we're, we're stronger in that position. We're more powerful. Okay. The 345s, I talked about the joint centration, all that kind of stuff. But to me, this is one of the most important ones, especially, and, and I've been on this crusade, getting the head out of the block, all right? When you watch our tape and you look at our helmets, our guys don't have the old, you know, the, the, the battle marks, the scars on the front of the helmet. If anything hits, it's going to be the face mask. We're not hitting that frontal lobe 65 times in a football game, right? And if you're teaching pad level, you're coaching pad level, and, and, and I'm not here to say there's anything wrong with that, what's the first thing that's making contact? It's the head. It's the frontal lobe, okay? So it allows us to make this game safer. And what we've seen is we've been even more powerful and, and our performance has improved. And I, you know, I put a picture of Mike Webster. Now, Webster was one of the best center of all time, maybe, all right? Uh, and here's great pad level, okay? Flat back, he's getting that guy moved. But what's the first thing on that defender? It's his head. Second thing is, if he rips off this block, Shoot, Mike Webster might be right on his face, and that guy might be tagging the ball carrier. All right, and I put a clip on here to back it up, all right, because I got a couple uh, guys right here that look good, they don't look good. Okay, so here's Landon, here's that 78, which we'll see again here in a second, all right, but here he is, you know, he's pushing his dad's van. Now, if, if he pushed up here with 345, his dad would get pissed because he dent, you know, he'd crinkle in the, the sheet metal there. So he's down on the bumper, okay? I just saw a guy push a semi truck with 345s, and, and, He's pushing a van, okay? Here's why we don't believe in pad level right here. This is Slippery Rock. This was week one a year ago. Here's basically all four guys. Their block separation technique, we call it a push-pull, all right? Almost in unison. It's an RPO, so we can't see the whole thing. But check this out, guys. Check this out right here. Let me get it right there, okay? All three guys, right when we go to break their leverage, it's a push and a pull. Some people call it a snatch, whatever you want to call it, all right? But if your weight forward... If your pads are down and flat back, you're going to be on the ground, okay? And watch what happens here. 78, start with him. He gets pulled, but he arches his back, and he gets back to position a little bit. 72, gets pulled, gets his feet back underneath, surges his hips. He's in good shape. Watch 69. He gets pulled, all right? His back is too flat. He's on the ground, all right? That guy's disconnected from the block, okay? Last thing I'm going to talk to you about here really quickly is the arch, is the upper body part of this, okay? Most complex joint in the body is the spine. Uh, we, we use it as the arch, the Roman arch. We know the arch is the strongest architectural shape there is, okay? Uh, on those old arches, they've lasted for years. Why? Because those blocks were made, you know, with these little kind of angles on them where gravity pushes them together and they actually become stronger together, all right? They're unbreakable, okay? That's the same thing we want in our spine is that arch, all right, and that arch makes that spine rigid, okay? When we get that big butt, big chest, and we call it a squatter's arch, big butt, big chest, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, on Twitter you see the, the, the twerking, all right? It's the butt out, chest out, okay? It's like the, you know, somebody flushes the toilet while you're in the shower and the cold water comes down, and you stick your chest out. That's the position we want to be in. That's your body saying, uh, I'm rigid, I'm ready, I'm, I'm strong, okay? And also the neck. We want to arch in the neck because it's the same thing. Okay, gravity pushes those things together, becomes more rigid, it protects the neck. Okay, without an arch, okay, if my back is perfectly flat, 
there's going to be force of all that glute, ham, and quad, all that stuff we just talked about, all that force developing through the ground, up through the body, it's going to leak out. And even worse, I see guys play with that, that hunchback. Now force is definitely leaking out. Okay, so you could squat 500 pounds, but if you play with a hunchback, by the time it gets to the defender, it might be 250 pounds. Okay, it's going to leak out. But if that, if it's arch, big butt, big chest, you're not going to lose any force coming through the center of the body. Okay, so it's the position of stability. The other thing it does when I got a big butt, big chest, is it puts tension, right? Especially when the butt's out, it puts tension on the glute ham tie-in right there. Okay, the bottom of the, the glute, the, the butt muscle, and the top of the hamstring. And that allows my hip to surge. That allows me to put force in the ground and drive down, okay? If I'm hunched up, all right, if I'm hunched up, that butt comes up, I can't use my, my hips the most effective way, okay? So it's a joint centration thing too, putting our joints in alignment so I can have the most force, okay? Watch 53 here. 53 was a former walk-on at the last place I had, just one of the smartest, best football players I've coached. So now he's playing against a dude. This nose over here, 99, played at Indiana, started games in the Big Ten. Grad transfer, all right? So 53 gets knocked back, all right? If you watch this, 53 gets knocked back in the backfield because this guy's a dude he's playing, all right? But watch what happens, okay? 53, he gets his arch, okay? He gets shin angles back in the ground. He puts force back in the ground, and then he's able to drive him back the other side of the line of scrimmage, and when he goes to reach for the ball carrier, he gets a great finish, okay? So I'll just show you that one time full speed here. Gets knocked back, arch. Okay, hip surge, drive him back off the line of scrimmage. All right, well, 72, great job zoning up. There's the pace, all right? There's the rhythm of the feet on the second level, all right? Right there, stays connected, a little bit of a hip surge. Okay, you see the feet are tight together, but it gets back to base and stagger, 345s, and he's able to mirror him laterally and drive him vertically, all right? Mirror him laterally and drive him vertically, and we get the ball out for a big one, okay? Right guard right here. We've got a base scheme, man scheme on the backside. I think we've got an insert on the backside of zone here, inside zone. All right, so he's getting flattened out right here. Okay, yeah, he's removing him out of his gap and all that. And that's pretty good. Okay, but he's got an arch in the back. Okay, and once that defender goes to grab, he's able to surge his hips and, and drive vertically. All right, right there, now he's able to drive vertically. Okay, so that arch in the back allows my hips to surge. I can break his leverage. Okay, let's watch 72 here. Left guard again, backside to inside zone. Here's that dude again. Here's 99, all right? Watch right here. He gets breaks his, breaks his leverage, all right? And now he doesn't break his leverage necessarily vertically. He kind of breaks it rotationally or laterally, all right? He torques him kind of out of his gap, all right? Moves him out of his gap, and then he's able to drive on up. Same thing with 78 here on the backside. He's going to zone up to the backside linebacker, all right? 345 is base and stagger. He tries to button press to get off that block to redirect, but because of the 345s you see right here, great shin angle, he's able to redirect, knock him on up the field, uh, outplay him, okay? And then I'm, I'm just going to finish here with one of the things everyone asks, well, what's the drill you use, coach? What's the drill? We call it demeanor drill. It's the old uh, adaptation of Jimmy McNally's duck walk drill, okay? But we are just rhythm of the feet, forcing the ground. We're going to go forward and back, all right? 345s, base and stagger, big butt, big chest, arm carry, chin up, all right, forward and back, training, developing that skill to stay in that position of power forward and back, okay? Forward and back. Now, I might be out in front of them moving them. Obviously, we're in quarantine here, lockdown, so they're doing it on their own, okay? And then I'll put a guy out in front of them, no contact. He'll back up, come forward. He'll mirror him, all right? I might put a hand shield. We do this, some version of this drill every single day, all right? And then he's going to move laterally. Okay, so he's going to forward back, and then he's going to move laterally. Feet are always apart, okay? We, you're not going to see boards at my practice. You're not going to see a shoot, okay, because at Lover's Field right behind me, 17,000 screaming fans. There's no boards on there on Saturday night. There's no shoot, okay? So we're going we're gonna to train that way we play, all right? His feet are always apart. Why? Because he's always having base and stagger because he's, he's pushing off his backside leg, sticking his call side leg. So his feet are always apart. He's able to maintain that position of power laterally. And then finally, we're going to do it rotationally too, all right? That rotational plane, that rotational plane, all right? And that's another clinic for another day with, with torque right there, okay? So I'm going to stop share. Um, I know I went fast right there. I know that was a lot of information, uh, maybe some new stuff to, to some people. But if you have any questions, shoot them out right now. 
Um, if something pops in your head down the road, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll put my, my info in here too, just so everyone's got it. Any questions, guys? Oh, there's nothing in there right now. Well, shoot, if we're good then, yeah, I appreciate the heck out of it. Loved recruiting this great state of Wisconsin. And uh, yeah, hope to get over there one of these days.